Hey guys, I have an awesome episode for you today with Dr. Jenna, and we talk about everything from how to get your first engagement to what you need to do in order to land $50,000 and more contracts with corporations. You are not going to want to miss this episode. Get your pen, get your pencil, get your paper, and get ready to learn. Welcome to the Speak Your Way to Cash podcast, a podcast where we teach speakers how to land paid speaking engagements and corporate contracts. Each week, we deliver high quality content that teaches you how to level up your speaking business. Be sure to join the Speak Your Way to Cash Facebook group after having your mind blown by this information filled episode. Now, here's your host, Ashley Kirkwood, lawyer and professional speaker. This is the Speak Your Way to Cash podcast. All right, guys, I am super excited today. Today, we have a super special guest. It's going to blow your mind. We have Dr. Jenna with us, and she's going to discuss her journey as a corporate speaker and how she got into the industry. Thank you so much for joining us on the Speak Your Way to Cash podcast. Hey, Ashley, thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here. I'm ready to chat with you, girl, because I see you doing the most on social media, and I love it. I have followed you. I have just taken some of your strategies and implemented. So I'm so grateful to be here today to serve you and your team. Awesome. Cannot wait to get, dig into your story. So just to give everyone an overview about how awesome you are, what is it that you do currently? So I specialize in mental health and business. So I own a training and consulting firm called the Think Up Group, where I teach companies and people how to create the future that they want by maximizing their message. So I take one story and I teach my people, my friends, how to think up and how to maximize and make that one story bigger. That is awesome. And so do you have a clinical psychology background? So actually my background, it's a little bit mixed. So I have a master's in counseling. So I used to be kind of a therapist and did that work. And then I have a PhD in management. Oh, wow. It's kind of very expensive. So I have the social service mental health background, which is all about the mindset and then the whole management background, which has allowed me to kind of pull and go more into business and business development and nonprofit development and really just leveraging kind of that corporate audience. Perfect. And how did you get started in speaking? So you have a company and speaking is one aspect of your company. Is that right? Absolutely. It's it's one aspect, but it's probably the biggest aspect because your message is your everything. Like when you can articulate, when you can communicate and tell like what I teach one story and make that one story bigger, that story will open doors. It will create opportunities for you. It will develop products for you. So it's really just one story. So the way I got started was really by accident. It was never intentional. It was never, uh, it was never anything planned out. You know, I was a girl where I always liked public speaking, even as a little girl, like I would be the one that would raise my hand in church and ask for like the longest Easter speech. So I always liked it, even though I was shy, I was nervous. I liked talking and I liked to kind of be in front of people. So back in 2012, I was invited to speak at a high school and it was during Black History Month and they wanted somebody to talk about how to turn your dream into reality. And I'm like, Mm. well, I don't think I'm supposed to be doing that because I'm in grad school. Like... (laughs) I'm not at the dream yet. This is stressful. You know, you're in the middle of a postgraduate degree. It's like, this is no dream. Like this is torture. So I came and I spoke at this school. And when I got there, I had this three page speech, Ashley, three page long speech that I would (laughs) deliver to high school students. So talk about that. Mm. Like how boring that would be if you're sitting up there reading this three page paper to high school students. So when I got there and I'd never spoken before, like outside of just, you know, presentations at work. So I got there and I'm sitting on the front row and I hear it so clear. It's like, tear the paper up. And I like look around. Cause I'm like, where did that come from? <laughs> and here I am, my heart's beating. Cause now they're reading my bio and I'm like, Oh my gosh, I have to go in front of all these kids. They're going to laugh at me. They're going to boo me. They're not going to listen. Like everything negative you could think about with speaking in front of a high school student is what was replaying in my mind. And then when they call my name at this point, I'm shaking. Like I'm literally shaking. So if you can see me right now, guys, just imagine you are literally shaking to where everything around just moving. And then I hear it again tear the paper up, just talk. So I'm going up and I'm literally about to cry because I'm like, why did I do this? Why didn't I back out? Why in the world would I even agree? You know, adrenaline and hyping yourself up before an event is amazing. And then when you get there, you're like, what in the world? (laughs) So I get on stage and I have this paper and I'm literally shaking. And if you watch the YouTube video, you can see my hand shaking. I'm shaking. And I said, you know what? 
I said, I just want to talk to you guys. And I was like, I have this long speech that I wrote out about empowering you and moving you to go after your dreams. But can we just have a conversation? And the kids are like, yeah, just talk. And they're like, oh. <laughs> so I literally tore the paper up. And they're like, yeah. Kids <laughs> are so honest. <laughs> yes, they are. And this message literally like just fell from heaven. And that's what happened. And it just came out and it was, Every single student in the room, it was 1,600 students, they were captivated. They were pulled in. And I was like, what in the world is this? And what I realized at that moment was, it wasn't about me helping them to identify their dreams and go after their dream. My dream was birthed. Mm, that's good. Someone recorded that. They put the video up and... That has been the number one video that has still gotten me booked and paid to speak seven years later. That is amazing. And how did you get that initial engagement? So on Facebook, just me sharing my story of like, hey, you know, I went through depression and I've been homeless and look at me now. I'm in grad school. I failed out of college, but hey, I'm working on a PhD. So just me always on social media, just sharing my personal story and just encouraging people. Like I wasn't doing this for a business. Yeah, I wasn't. And thinking about a business, I was literally in grad school working full time and I would just share my story and just encourage people. And someone saw it and said, you would be great to speak at my school. And guess what, Ashley, since, because I'm very open with talking numbers, yeah. they pay a whopping $150 and girl, I thought I was balling. Yes. I got $150 for telling my story. Oh my goodness. Like I went and celebrated at Chili's. Like that's how excited yeah. I was. I got $150. But not, it was a paid engagement and it was, it was inbound. So, And not knowing, number one, I didn't know people got paid to speak because I right. wasn't in the circle. And then number two, I'm like, you're going to pay me just to tell my story? So then my mind is like, well, if, if there's one person that will pay $150, maybe there's somebody else. Exactly. And that's how kind of the story got started. Yeah, that's dope. That's really cool. And I think that it it just speaks to the fact that sometimes you can speak to your heart, tell your story, and it'll resonate. And for a lot of speakers, it's, or a lot of aspiring speakers, it's like, how do you get that first engagement? How do I get that room full of 1600 people that I can, you know, photograph myself in front of and or get the recording of so that I can get additional engagements. And what would you say to that person who's looking for that first break? I would definitely say start where you are. So get on social media, talk, encourage people, share your story, motivate people every single day. Then identify the type of person, the type of place that you want to connect with and partner with and speak and ask them. You know, I always say closed mouths don't get fed. Like it's nothing wrong with asking. It's nothing wrong with saying, you know what? I would love to come and speak. Even if they don't pay you, there is value in just getting the experience. There's opportunity to get testimonials and referrals. There's opportunity to to get video from them, to get photography from them. The thing is, is to get yourself speaking because it will literally create the momentum. And Dave Ramsey always talks. He said, momentum is what makes businesses move. So if you want your business to grow and if you want your business to scale, you need momentum. So how can you create the momentum? And back then, Ashley, I was so hungry. I would have went and spoken at a backyard barbecue. Right. Like I would have literally went any and everywhere that I could because it was, it was this high that I felt. Yeah. It was like I became somebody totally different. And I love the feeling. I love the feeling doing the process. And I love, like I was on this natural high after. So I was everywhere. And that's really what catapulted the business. People saw me everywhere. And I created the story, the, even the perception on social media that I was the biggest, hottest speaker in this industry. Nobody knew that I wasn't getting paid or I was only getting 150. Exactly. All they saw was that everywhere I went, I was using social media to capture the experience. I had pictures, I had testimonials. I, it was it was so like early in the game where we didn't have really good video on our phones. I had this little flip recorder that I would say, hey, hold up, can, you, can I get a testimonial? And I would flip that thing open. It was like $30. And I would get a testimonial right then and there. And then I would go and I would put it out on social media. 
And that's what you should do. And even still, you know, if you don't hire a videographer for all your engagements on your phone, get testimonials, just record it horizontally and yeah. put it out there if you can, because that's still going to, that still works. That's, that yeah. still works. You still need yeah. testimonials. It's great if you have them in video because you can always transcribe them and put them on your website, but you still need to do that. So when did it go from, okay, I did this one gig for $150 to I am, or, or I'm going to have a speaking business. And how did that business look yeah. for you? What processes did you put in place to make the momentum of getting paid engagement stick? Yeah. So my first year, so starting in February of 2012, I'd had around 36 speaking engagements in one year by simply me just sharing this story in social media. So people would say, well, what's your fee? And I would be like, I don't have a fee. So the initial fee that I started charging was $700. I don't know where okay. 700 came from. I was just like 700. So then people would say, um, oh, well, you know, we have allocated $1,500. I'm like, oh. So then I'm like, well, let me be 1500 So it was really the market for me that was driving the price. I did it for one year, kind of up and down, no rate, no actual business, just speaking. I reached out to this speaker coach that I had followed ever since I was a freshman in college. And he was booming. He was one of, one of the top college speakers. And Is I reached it out to him. No, it was Jonathan Sprinkles. Jonathan Sprinkles. Okay. Yes. So I reached out to Jonathan and I said, hey, I don't know if you've seen me, but I'm like a top female speaker. I'm like the girl Jonathan Sprinkles. And I said, check out this video. And it was, you know, looking back, it's not the best video. You know, you're right. just getting started. So Jonathan's sitting back like, ha ha ha, good job. You know, really like, you need some help. So it's like, hey, I have this boot camp where I teach people how to do this because speaking is a multi billion dollar business. Yeah. And I'm like, Shut the front door. You're telling me this $150, $700, I can make more? So I went to his boot camp and I didn't have the money. So I didn't have the money to go to the boot camp. It was $497. And I was like, well, how am I going to do this when all my speaking money, I was reinvesting it back into videos. I was reinvesting yeah. back into the website. And I was like, well, I don't really have $500 right now. Like I just had to pay for another semester of school because mm -hmm. it was in January. I'm like, I don't have 500 that I can freely invest into this conference. Real quick, are you sitting at home wishing that there was a conference that you could attend to blow up your speaking business? Well, you're in luck because Speak Your Way to Cash is that event. We're coming to both Chicago and Atlanta. If you are in Chicago, go to SYWTC.eventbrite.com. And if you're looking to come to the Atlanta event, go to SYWTC.com. 3.eventbrite.com. At both of these events, you will learn how to book paid speaking engagements, how to find paid speaking engagements, how to make your first 50K in your speaking business, where to find engagements to pitch, what to do when you get on the phone. Are sales calls not your thing? You'll even get a script that you can use on your sales call with potential clients. There's no event like it. You'll even learn how to get yourself in the press to help you get your speaking fee up as a speaker. All right, let's get back to this interview. See you soon. And someone on social media said, I prayed and God told me to give you $500. Like I never, like just out of the blue. Whoa. And I, and I knew it was my sign to be there. So I walk into this room and I am just blown away by the magnitude and the caliber of the people, how these people have been on Oprah. Mm -hmm. These are yeah. bestsellers. It was a New York Times bestseller. And I'm like, what in the world? Like I'm playing way too small. And it was at that moment that I said, if I'm going to do this, then I'm going to give 110% and I'm going to put everything into it and I'm going to make this official. So I made it official on January 26, 2013. Wonderful. The game changed. That is wonderful. And when you say you made it official, what did you do first? What was your first official step? So the first thing was, you know, I didn't know anything about all the legal and law stuff, but all I knew was like, I'm not supposed to be going to jail for running a business undercover. So I consulted with an attorney and we went ahead and we set up the LLC. So that was one of the things. And the attorney, you know, and I, because I know that my people say, well, I don't have any money. So I bartered with this attorney. This attorney wanted to promote their law firm and get more into kind of the speaking realm. So they were mm -hmm. like, well, how did you do it? Because if you can do it, I know that I can do it. I said, well, yeah. you know, I don't help you with a process. And this is me one year. I didn't have... This was no formal process. I sat down with the attorney and just told them everything that I had done and what I was doing. And they said, hey, well, I will show you how to structure your LLC. 
Yeah. So that was just an even exchange that we worked out. So that was the first thing. Then the second thing that I did is I needed a lead magnet. I had no yes. idea what that was, but I was speaking now to groups of 500 and more people. So um, I, so a friend of mine was like, you need to capture their email addresses. Like you need to have a way to capture. So that was the second thing that I did, the lead magnet. And it was funny because I had this event in like two days and there was going to be um, six, um, like 1,300 people at this event. And I was like, well, how am I going to capture? Like people say you need an email list. You know, people were just talking then about an email list. And I'm like, well, this is the first thing I'm going to do. And I still have it up today. I will never take it down, but it's called successbeyondstress.com. And I was teaching people how to have success even when their life is stressful. It was probably the worst product I've ever created, but people still download it today and I will never take it down because I always remind my clients that it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be perfect. You just have to start. Right, right. That's what I started with, that free tool. And it went from there of building my list. And what is success beyond stress? So when you go there, were they downloading an ebook or? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so it's an ebook that really just talks about step by step what do you need to do if you want to achieve success in your life. Like if your life is stressful, if you are feeling overwhelmed, if you're feeling depressed, if you're feeling anxious or stuck, this is a step by step process that will help you move from where you are to where you want to be. Because that's what I was talking about at the time. Okay, awesome. That's really cool. That's really cool. And you said you were doing engagements with 500 plus people, and this was all just from inbound leads from. Were these schools? Were these nonprofits? Who were the audiences? These were schools, nonprofits, and churches. So, okay. they, so they would hear me and then they would say, oh, I have someone I need to connect you with. So everything was word of mouth. Everything I've never promoted on social media at that time, like book me, because I didn't even know to be booked. I was just like, oh, well, people just keep calling and asking. So it would, I would do one event and I would literally get three more from the one event. Which is and good. Then, That's how it should be. And that has still been how my business is structured. So, you know, I'm not a big social media person in terms of like, hey, this is what I'm doing. Hire me. A lot of like most of my business is made offline. Which is also very, very good. And that makes a lot of sense. So for um, when you went to the event, the boot camp with Jonathan Sprinkles, did they talk about sales and marketing and outbound, um, outbound reach and all of that? Not at all. So the focus of his boot camp is really how do you create your signature message? So how do you really have this presentation power? So how do you captivate an audience? How do you build this presence? How do you just kind of create this connection with people? So all the other tools that I've learned out just over the last kind of six years have been trial and error of like, okay, this isn't working. What are they doing? I follow people's habits and rhythms. I look at how speakers are posting on social media, how often, what are they talking about? Like I study the mechanics. Mm-hmm. Like I go to YouTube, like, like there was no business coach that I hired that really helped me to do that. It was me just learning, but I'm a researcher. Like I'm a girl that's a researcher. So it was me learning and like filling in the gaps. But what happened with the because I've shared on social media how I landed a $50,000 contract a month after I've said, oh, this is going to be an official business. So you go from making $1,000, $1,500 was, $2,200 was the most I'd made at that time to somebody's paying you $50,000. And it was really simple. I went to an event that I was terrified to be in, that I wasn't even qualified to be in. And I shared my story of depression and how depression literally robbed me and how now I was on this mission to empower people to get over it. And someone in the audience heard me speak about depression and said, I'm, and, and contacted me a few weeks later and said, I am looking for an African-American female that has experience with depression, that is willing to share on a national scene how she overcame depression. But if I would have never invested, if I would have never said, you know what, I'm going to go here, even though I don't have a website, even though I don't have all this fancy stuff, Mm -hmm. even though, you know, I don't have, you know, nice graphics and all these things created, even though I feel so, so, so underqualified, I'm still going to put myself in this room. I'm still going to show up. If I would have never did that because I was looking at everybody else's successes, I would have missed out on that opportunity. And what event, what event was that? 
So this was, it was another, it was just like this networking event. It was just local networking event that I decided to go to. Cool. And just, it literally changed my life because I met this person. I saw the person in the room, but didn't connect with the person. So three weeks later, when they're emailing like, hey, I got your name from such and such who was there. Cause I was trying to figure out who was that girl? Who was she? And then that's how I got connected. Okay, cool. So in terms of things that people can duplicate, because I know this is always hard for people when they hear it. They're like, oh, okay, great. Like I go to these events, I speak. I don't have any events that are inviting me to speak. So, but the other thing is too, you can't go to the wrong place and speak for the wrong audience. It has to be the right audience because if it's not the right audience, they can't do anything for you. So it's just not going to pay off. I mean, it pays off in terms of you getting more comfortable speaking, but for people, a lot of the people who listen to Speak Your Way to Cash, you know, they're full-time entrepreneurs or they're full-time employees who have a side business. So their time is strained. What um, specific associations or events would you recommend they attempt to speak at that have been fruitful for you in the past? So that's a good question because I don't really, and this is just total, totally transparent. I don't do a lot of events just to attend. Mm -hmm. When I do an event, I'm doing it for strategic. Like I'm strategically getting on the, like I'm strategically positioning myself there as a speaker. So I right. can't really provide feedback of where to go as a conference. I would definitely recommend. No, 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 not as a conference. I mean, where should they be speaking to position oh, themselves yeah. as a speaker? Yes. So that has been strategically beneficial for your business. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. So I believe in fishing with a net and not a hook. Mm -hmm. So I look for conferences where there are going to be 10 or more people that, that are specifically from my industry that I can connect with. So for example, I look for association meetings. Another example that I do, every, every city has a public relations association. So there's mm -hmm. this PR professionals. If you want media, I speak at those events and talk to them about how they can maximize their message and do those things. And that's how I create relationship. So I go to association meetings. I go to meetings where there are going to be attorneys, where it's an attorney meetup, where there are doctor meetups. So what I would recommend is thinking about your target audience, the people that you know that they connect and they align with you. And they also have the money to pay you. It may not be a lot all the time, but they have some money. Go to their meetups. Most of the time, their meetups are locally in your city. They're always looking for speakers. They always are looking for somebody to come in and do a monthly speaking. Position yourself there. Be completely clear. Use their language and have an opt-in where they can download immediately that they can use immediately. That makes a lot of sense. And when you say meetups, are these the meetups in the traditional, like the meetup groups like that you find online? Absolutely. Okay. So cool. meetup groups online, you know, um, one of the things, because I'm in mental health and kind of the mindset, so there's social work. So there's like, let's just say the Texas Social Work Association. They have meetings in Houston. They have meetings in Dallas. They have meetings in San Antonio. I'm going to keep, number one, I'm going to follow them on social media. And I'm going to share and I'm going to comment. So I'm going to become active with them on social media. Number one, before I even make a pitch. Number two, I'm going to share value with something that they are doing. So I'm going to say, you know what? I heard you speak at this event or I saw your live stream, Ashley, and it was amazing. You talk specifically about how to price and set my speaking fees and not feeling intimidated by it. Like I'm going to like, I'm going to share something that they've said. This really changed me because immediately I did X, Y, Z. Immediately I increased my prices. So I'm going to not only remind them that I've been following you and watching you, but this is what you taught me and this is what I did immediately. So I'm going to stick my landing there. And then I'm going to say, if you are ever interested in having someone that can come and talk about how you can tell, take one story and leverage media, then I'm the girl for it. Let me know how we can connect. And they'll be like, oh my gosh, I would love to. I've never gotten no one that has said, no, we're not interested. That's really good advice. That's really good advice. And I love how specific and actionable it is as well. Um, and I, I would be remiss if I didn't go back to the fact that you said after you decided to make it official, you got this $50,000 contract. Was that because you said your rate to do the speech was $50,000 or was that a package of some sort that you put together for the organizer? So my, so my fee was $1,500 at the time. So that's okay. what I told them that I 
that this is what my rate is, is 1500. What happened was I did one event for them at the 1500 rate. I did one event and they were like, oh, we need this. So I sat with them and said, okay, well, who, like, how can we take this? Like, how can we expand this? Because they said, well, we, we need this from our company, but how would this look? Mm-hmm. How would this look if we turn this into a program? Not just a speaking engagement, not just you doing this one keynote, but a program. So I literally created this program, went back with them for about three weeks on, yes, no, this will work. And then they agreed. And I said, this is what it's going to take. And it was, and the program was, it was seven talks. And it was 15 minutes of talk. And then and, what did you do after the 15 minutes? Was it like a Q&A or something of that nature? It was nothing. It was, so, was I talked and that was it. So seven talks, 15 minutes of talk and 50K. And 50K. Was it out of state or no? Yes, it was. It was all over. It was in, I had speaking engagements in New Jersey. I had speaking engagements engagements in LA, um, New York, Philly, Chicago. So it was seven different cities, 15 minutes talk. That's dope. That's really dope. I I was working full time. So I'm like, shut the front door. This is like half of what I'm making going to work. Yeah. And how did you come up with the rate? Did you just think of it yourself or? Yeah, there was nothing scientific about it. I just said, well, I need $1,500 because this will cover what I'm trying to do. And that was it. So then with the 50K, I was just like, well, let's just do 50. <laughs> it was no, that's I was but it that's, was no calculated. It was nothing strategic. It was like, you know, it's, it's so funny when you're just getting started. I had no fear. Like I wasn't afraid. I wasn't in my head. I was literally like, if you told me no, I didn't care because I'm just going to go somewhere else. Like later on in entrepreneurship, I started becoming more calculated. I started becoming more strategic. And I started kind of saying, well, what if this doesn't work? What if they say no? Like that game played harder later than it did at the very beginning. At the very I beginning, totally understand that because I literally walked off my like close to $300,000 job and didn't even think about failing. It was like, like someone was like, what if it doesn't work? And I was like, I'm sorry, what? Like, that's not an exactly. option. <laughs> Exactly. Like, I'm gonna work. What are you talking about? So, I went through school, and my school was rigorous. Like, okay, I'm not afraid of like challenge, and that you know, like that was me. Yeah. It's like I wasn't afraid. It like, doesn't after, come until later. Yeah, yeah. And then, like later on, once once the business started moving, like really moving, then I'm like, oh, this 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 is. You know what? Let me let me go back. I think when I started following other entrepreneurs. And people started saying, this is hard. It's going to be challenging. It's, and I was like, oh, well, maybe I'm doing something wrong because this isn't, mm. hard. This isn't challenging for me. So then I started creating things to be hard and challenging. Mm, that is so profound for so many reasons. <laughs> and that's what shifted in a negative way with my business because at the yeah. beginning, Hard. I would speak. I get three speaking engagements. That's easy. I mean, it's not hard telling your story. Right. Like, you tell the story. Somebody says, "Oh, well, here's three more other here. Here's five thousand dollars to go and do over here." And I'm like, "Oh, so that wasn't." But when I started hearing other entrepreneurs following people on YouTube and social media and podcasts, I'm like, "Well, it's going to be hard when you start a business. It's going to be challenging the first three years." I'm like, "Well, maybe I'm doing something wrong because mm. this is hard." And I didn't have the mental stamina that I have now. To say, well, it may be hard for you, but it's not hard for me. Exactly. Like, and I, that's that's like, great. I accepted, it. I accepted it and said, oh, well, this is hard. And then I started making it hard and making things hard. Mm, that is so good. I love that for so many reasons. I'm going to try to make that the clip of the because that's so it's so it's yeah. so vital that you said that because, you know, I think we overthink things when we really want them as well. And so yeah. we really want things. And so we're like, oh, I got to make this so difficult. I need to do all this work. And I am someone that actually does pitch to get engagement. So in the collegiate market, like these colleges don't know you and they don't know each other either. So, yeah. you know, I do pitch to get the engagements, but that's because I started in the middle of the year. So for those people who follow me and are in the Speak Your Way to Cash Facebook group, which should be everyone that's listening, um, you all know that um, there are conferences where colleges go and they book speakers. And if you go to that one conference, you could get five to 10 engagements booked. You could also get zero booked and it costs money to go. So it's like a 2000 
to $3,000 investment to attend, but you're in front of all of your ideal audiences. Because I speak off season, or I started speaking full time off season, I had to tell all those individual colleges about myself prior to that big event, which I'm going to, and I'll be keynoting one of those conferences coming up in July. But yeah, I'm super excited about that. That's going to be great in front of all the advisors for all the colleges that um, a lot of the colleges that I would love to speak at. So, you know, it doesn't have to be hard if you are strategic, but also there's something to just doing what you say you're going to do. So if you're a speaker, you have to speak. You have to be speaking somewhere. And if you don't have any engagements booked, you have to find engagements to speak at because you won't build the momentum that you spoke about earlier without speaking. You just have to speak. People have to see you speaking. They have to think of you as a speaker. They need to, you need to be first of mind. And that only happens if you're speaking. It won't happen if you're at home thinking you're speaking. (laughs) And another thing I teach, you know, kind of newbies to do, look at Eventbrite, look at the events that are in your area. And even though they may already, already have their speakers, reach out to those people that are hosting the events and build a relationship with them. I have found so many events uh, because I travel a lot. So when I'm traveling, I always kind of look to see what's going on in the city. And I have booked maybe seven or eight just by looking on Eventbrite and letting them know, hey, I'll be in your city. I'm speaking at this other event um, because, you know, I'm kind of asserting myself into your event. You don't have to pay me my normal fee. We can agree on $500, $1,000 because somebody else is already paying me there and I'm just popping in on their event. And I have gotten seven or eight speaking engagements by just doing that. By just And they were paid, which is great. Mm-hmm. I think the least amount of money I've ever gotten from one of those was maybe like 500. And did you look for, so on Eventbrite, I've seen that before too. There's a lot of people on Eventbrite, like myself, I'm an event organizer, but I don't hire speakers for my events, of course. Um, How do you decipher between that? So how have you been able to figure out like which organizers you're looking for or, or all of that? So most of them are not really looking for people. Most of them already have their event planned. Yeah. So I just pop in and say, hey, I saw you're having this amazing event. I saw that you're talking about X, Y, and Z. Have you thought about talking about how mindset impacts money? Have mm-hmm. you thought about talking about teaching your women how to take their story and leverage the media? So I kind of look at what they're doing and I find a gap. And I find the gap that I can do. And then I share with them, hey, well, so I think the last one I did was about... um It was a women empowerment event, but they were teaching women kind of how to start a business and how to promote their business. But I didn't see anything about media. And I said, well, hey, in 2017, I was a resident of a Fox affiliate and I had over 117 speaking engagements and excuse me, 117 media appearances. I will share you. I will show I will show your woman step by step how to do that Mm -hmm. from the pitch to this to that. And I said, you know, my normal fee is usually 7,500, but I can do your event for 500 since I'm already going to be there. And this is what they'll get. And then I'll give them something tangible, like a workbook or something that they can download and they can walk through the steps. Yeah, that's pretty cool. That's really cool. So I think that that begs the question of um, how were you in so many media appearances? How did you work that out? That's something that I, that's one of the things that I think makes Speaker Ready Cash so different is that I, my first paid speaking engagements um, came from people seeing me in the news or seeing me in an article or seeing me on television. And well, my first engagement came from them seeing me in um, a print publication in Chicago. Um, I've since gotten engagements from people who've seen me on television as a correspondent. So how were you able to get yourself in the press? So the press, so initially, so I've always had me, because of my former work, I was executive of a nonprofit organization. Mm -hmm. So I did a lot of media work then. So I had kind of some of the, I had a little bit of connections with the media, but in terms of like talking about it from my own business, everything was from social media. I only pitched myself to media when I got the resident event. Everything literally was on social media. And let me just talk about this on social media because if you go to my Facebook or Instagram, I do not have a lot of followers. So I want to just put that in there now. You do not have to have a lot of followers. You have to be able to give value. You have to be able to be consistent and you have to be able to provide quality content when you're working with the media. Because some people think, oh, I have to have 10,000 followers and do this. You do not at all. Mm -hmm. They're looking for people that can show up, that can be clear, that can be concise, and that can deliver. So many of my first media appearances happened from social media of just Being on there, telling my story, depression, homelessness, living in a closet. The way that I booked the resident 
was um, a publicist had had connected me with the show in Houston and said they're looking for someone to come and talk about New Year's goal setting. So when I showed up at the event, um, it was a live, it was a live taping. And when we finished, the host was like, oh my gosh, you were amazing. She said, you must do this all the time. And I said, no, I said, maybe a couple of times a year, but not all the time. She said, you are really good. And I said, well, I've been practicing for this moment. And she said, what do you mean? I said, well, I've been working on this for three years. I have a three minutes and I have a seven minute segment. So I know when you call me, if you need me for three minutes, I can do this. If you need me for seven, I can do this because I studied and I knew how long people were getting on the news. And I said, so right. I've been waiting for you to call. So I didn't just wait for the call. I've been preparing. And I was, I was like, well, so what took you so long? Why'd you, why'd you wait so long? And she was just like, man, that's like amazing. I said, yes, because I knew that you would call. I didn't know when. So right. I was also in motion. So then the publicist, wasn't my publicist. I didn't hire her. She just was like, you know, you're amazing. I think this will be a great opportunity for you. She said, have you ever thought about becoming a resident? Because the way that you connected and transformed the people there, you would be a perfect person to be a resident. And I said, I haven't. And so what then, is a resident? So a resident is a person that comes every week and they have their own segment and their own space. So what I did, I reached out to the station. I reached out to two stations and they brought me in and I did kind of just a segment. And then the other one, the um, producer said, man, you were really, really good. Anytime you want to come back, let us know. So for me, that was my opportunity. Yep. Let me know. So I pitched her immediately and said, this is what I can do. I know that your demographics are people that are looking for more because it's a smaller town type area. Mm -hmm. So entrepreneurship is just now kind of captivating that, that space. So I was like, I know that your audience is looking for more. They feel stuck. They, they don't know where to start. Let me come on every once a week. And this is what I can do. I will write and I will produce it. I will create the script. You don't have to do anything. I will, I will create all the graphics. All you have to do is turn the cameras on and I got it. And she said, let's try it. So they signed me initially for six weeks. So I did it for six weeks and it was a motivational Monday. And it was literally three minutes of me dropping tools and information. And then after the six weeks, they signed a year long contract. The only reason I'm not doing it now is because I relocated to a different area. And now but is it, is that unpaid? So some are unpaid for people. Mine was paid. So some are unpaid. Some are paid. The ones it, and let's just be honest. It's harder to get a paid spot because paid, they're looking, you know, it's kind of the sponsorships. So right. even when I started, so when I started, it wasn't paid. So when I started, right. it wasn't paid, which was fine because I wasn't looking for it to be paid. I needed the content. And you like, want the, uh, the credibility that comes with that. And I think I absolutely. asked that question, like, I know that most of them are unpaid, at least in, in the Chicago market, because there's so many yeah. people that want them. And what I will tell people is, because they, because I go on um, WCIU and I talk about legal stuff and they're like, oh, so do you get paid for that? And I'm like, no, mm -mm, you don't get paid for that. But you can leverage that to be a bigger Absolutely. opportunity. You can leverage every video that I've ever done. I have it. I use it. But then I took that same. So once they said yes, then I went to the local radio station and I said, hey. I just signed a deal where I'm going to be giving this. I know that your audience needs something similar, but a little bit different. So I pitched it with the media. So on Mondays, I did TV. On Thursdays, I did radio. And I did, and so I had a radio contract too with the biggest station in Houston. Love it. I love that. That's dope. Really good. And it just shows that the initiative is there. So you have to have some ingenuity, some initiative and listen out to those, those whispers that are like, anytime you want to come back, because they always say that. And I'm going to tell you, like, every time you go on television, if you don't completely screw it up, they're going to say, anytime you want to come back, come see us. And what yeah. most people do is they assume that means that they've been invited back. But if you don't have a specific date, a specific time and a specific yeah. producer, you have not been invited back. Like you have to take the initiative to pitch yeah. and they may not accept your first pitch, but if you keep no. pitching, they will inevitably accept something if it's good. <laughs> and, actually, and what I found most people, they wait for the news to call them back. Yeah, and that's not how it works. My follow-up game, like someone asked me, I was meeting with my mastermind sisters yesterday and we were talking about front-end business and like follow-up. My follow-up game is hands down tight. Like 
Like if I could say there's one thing in my business that is so tight and so strong, it's my follow-up game. So when she said, let me know when you want to come back, within 48 hours, it was already done. When I'm in my car driving, I hit record and I'm like literally talking through what's going to go on that pitch. The minute I got home, I went, I created it, you know, revised it. You know, for me, I'm a spiritual person. So I prayed over it and I said, bam. So within 48 hours, you have everything that you need. Like there's no question. Yeah. And for them, your audience kind of stick pick. The reason why I've been able to have so many recurring media, they say you're so easy to work with. Mm-hmm. I do it for them. They don't have to think about the questions. They don't have to think about statistics. They don't have to think about anything. Yep. I provide all of that for them. I take care of it on the front end for them. Their graphics, the credits for the graphics, what size, like I get with the pre- I get with the editing people, like, what size do you need it? What's like, what's the best font? Yeah. Like, I have all of that worked out. So when I show up, it's literally, they upload and they, and they turn the lights on and we are, and we're live. We're go time. And that's so, that's so helpful. And the fact that you can be clear, concise, and quick, because what a lot of people don't recognize is they may say, you get on, I mean, every time I go on air, depending on the size of the story. So I did like the Jesse Smollett, the R. Kelly cases. R. Kelly had a lot more going on. And so like that segment was longer. I think that was like eight minutes. And then I also did like the Supreme Court case with Brett Kavanaugh and covered that. And so that was a little bit shorter because it's Supreme Court and it's local news. And so typically local news likes local stories. That's a federal story. So it was a lot shorter, but you have to be prepared to answer their questions in a very quick and concise way or else they won't invite you back. And it can't be, it has to be like, and then show your personality. Because I think that when people get those opportunities, They, at least for me, my first time on air, oh my God, there's a visible difference between my first time and my sixth time. Like I was so straight laced. I was just like, okay, let me just get this out. And it was, it was technically correct, but it didn't show what made me different. And that has to be, they're interested in what makes you different. They're interested in your opinions. They're interested in you like taking it to the edge a little bit, like doing something that's, that everyone can't do. And we have to be, I think, especially as newer entrepreneurs, We have to be conscious of the fact that we have something special and that something special is your competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. So never hide that something special. In corporate, you always hide the something special. Mm -hmm. But as an entrepreneur, never hide the something special. (laughs) So actually, with you being in a bigger market, like Chicago, I guess Houston, Chicago, kind of big market. So with you being in a bigger market, did you find it was more challenging to get on the news? Yeah. Yeah. So with me being in a bigger market, the way I did it was, you know, I interviewed or I saw a friend of mine that was on a station. I messaged her and was like, hey, can I send, because she was there at that moment. Like it was like 5 a.m. And I'm like, hey, I noticed that you're on there. I had just read Make It Rain by Ariva Martin, which talked about getting TV appearances. And so I already had a pitch. So I was like, hey, you're there. Show this to the producer if you don't mind. They showed it to the producers. I got an email. I sent the pitch. And I sent story suggestions based on what they had already featured on the the channel. And then um, I went from there. And the first time I pitched, I don't think I got on, but I kept pitching like probably 13 pitches. And I've been on like six or seven times. And so now it's pretty consistent. If something comes up for legal, then they're going to call me. Um, And the first time it's like, hi, this is Ashley. She's a lawyer. The the last time it's like, hey, this is Ashley, our legal correspondent for WCIU. Let her know. So like, it was really awesome. Like I got to know the host. They were great. Um, you know, meeting people offline. So it, it's all about a pitch. It is more difficult for like the ABC, like uh, Windy City Live is a big one here. So those are a lot more challenging. But even with those, you just keep pitching. You keep pitching. Yes. You call the station. You get the name of the producer. You send them an email. You leave them a message. You keep pitching. You keep doing what you need to do. And if you do it consistently, it'll definitely pay off. And I think for a lot of us, we just stop we, we stop too soon. Like we don't pitch enough. We don't go far enough before giving up. So yeah, that's yeah. one thing I wanted to ask you about in terms of prospecting with the corporate clients that you have now. Yeah. How, do you, um, how do you find them? And what do you do once you find a client you'd like to work with? What's kind of your process? So you see okay. someone you'd like to work with, what's the process for getting them from prospect who doesn't know you to client who's paying you okay. your invoice? So Ashley, I'm gonna, okay, so do you wanna know The professional answer or the real answer? The real answer. Okay, so the real answer, I look at places I want to go. I look at vacation spots. Like literally, like literally. (laughs) I look at places that I want to visit and go. So if I want to go to New York or to Florida, I'm going to look up the top 20 conferences in this area or the top 20 people that are doing this. And that's how I start. I start with my hot list. So it's a list of 20 to 100 
places, people, and spaces that I want to be in. So I start there. Then I connect with people on social media. So that's kind of the first stop connecting with them where you can see what they're doing, you can learn more about them, and then you start following and then you start commenting and start creating communication there. So that's kind of the first. Then the second thing, so say for example, I want to speak at the American Dog Association. I want to teach dog owners how to think up. So what I'm going to do, so after I'm following the people on social media, I'm going to reach out to them and say, hey, Bob, I saw that you are planning the American Dog Association. This is so amazing. Like, I love everything that you're doing. I would love to talk to you to learn more about your event. So usually people are like, oh, absolutely, because they don't know why I'm asking. So that's step one. Then I get on the phone and it's literally all about them. So I'm asking, you know, tell me about the event. So what's really your vision? What do you see like as your top challenges? So I'm not asking in like an interview. It's really just like a conversation. Like yeah. Yeah. So I'm like filtering like your like um, your challenges, your vision, you know, like what are your goals? And I'm like, that is so amazing. Then I kind of connected with, you know, that's actually something that I have done or that's something that I am working with, with the CAD Association. And like, really? Well, tell me a little bit more. So then I tell them more about what I'm doing. And they're like, oh, well, we would love to connect with you. Okay. Then I say, oh, well, who's the best person? that brings in speakers. Like I would love to kind of learn more because I would love to be there. So then I connect with that person. So it's usually around three to four conversations before I even ask for the sale. And it's not a hard sale. So it's not, can you book me to speak? It is, well, I would love to help you achieve your goal of teaching your dog owners how to think at a higher level, how to go after their dreams and how to create legacy for their pet family. And that way it's more relational, which I think for the corporate space, like that's, that's the biggest um, opportunity and challenge, if you will, because it takes time. And I think that for people, the one thing that they have to understand is what, what I had to understand is that it's going to take you time to get that pipeline of 50 engagements a year. So you need to do the work every single day that it takes in order to get your way up to that. Every single day I have, we reach out to 30 people a week. So every day, so we don't do it every day anymore. So we have set days, two days a week that we are doing what we call dripping. So we're dripping on these people and we have it a calendar. So one month, it may be sending thank you cards to people. The next month, it may be uh, finding an article that connects with them. We have Google alerts set up on everybody for anything. So it may be sending them, hey, Ashley, I saw this legal expert in Houston talking about this. I think this would be amazing. I know that you're doing incredible work too. Check this out and let me know how I can help you. Right. So I may send them things that are related to them. So we're dripping on people. Right now, my sales close rate, meaning from the time I see a prospect to the time we close, is four months. When I used to start, so when I started really looking at this and I was in 2015, it was nine months. So now we have a four month. So four month for me, making a cold call, turning a cold prospect into a contract is a four month process. And most people, they literally would have stopped. Like, I'm not doing this. I don't have time. They literally would have stopped, but I follow it through and I create relationships. So then when people have events or when they're looking for someone, they either bring me back, 80% of my business, I've been speaking with them since 15, since 2015. So for the last few years, or they connect me and say, oh, well, you need to talk to this association or they'll bring the association to me. Hey, I think Jenna will be amazing to open up your gala. And that's okay. That's a really good point. I love that you have those numbers for four months um, close. I think that's great. Um, We do something similar in terms of colleges, but we typically do cold email call, follow up call, sometimes another call. (laughs) And then we're sending out the contract because I think the phone is where it really happens. Um, it's it's it definitely yeah, it doesn't happen on email. They got to talk mm-hmm. to you. They got to feel your energy. And I will even do this. Let me give you guys one of my think up secrets. I will even just send a video. So if someone reaches out to me via my website and they go through the whole process, I'll send the video back instead of like, instead of like using the email sequence that we have set up. So normally if they'll, if they'll reach out to me, they'll say, Hey, we're interested in bringing you on to speak. Right. Then the automated system will say, oh, well, let's schedule a time to talk. Instead of doing that, I will actually jump in and do a video and say, hey, Ashley, I got your email. I'm so excited. I'm so pumped up and ready to talk to you. I love the incredible work that you're doing. Let's chat because I have some ideas on how we're going to make this event your best event. So I'll do like a quick one minute video like that, send it to them. 
And then like, don't even follow the whole email sequencing, like just me insert myself there. And they're like, oh my gosh, this is personal. Yeah. And that's, that's going to make a huge difference because they get pitched all the time. A lot of event organizers are getting pitched quite a bit. So that is, that's awesome. This is all very, very, very good feedback. So where can, or actually there was one other question I wanted to ask before we close it out. You have a signature speech and you have a brand surrounding that speech. How long did it take you to get clarity around that? And how did you come to figure out this is what I'm going to do? Because that is that is key. As speakers, you're selling your speech. And that's what I try to get people to get in the mindset of. You're not like, hey, I'm a speaker, because that doesn't matter. It's like, hi, I am an expert. <laughs> I have three talks that I offer or two talks that I offer or even better, one talk that I offer um, around this topic. So how did you hone that down and narrow in on that so that that is your signature speech? It was a two-year process. You know, I started off talking about depression. And, you know, I was hitting up the schools and churches and doing that. But I'm like, okay, I really want to get into, because let me just be honest. I don't like chasing money. Mm -hmm. I don't like one-time money. I like long money. I want to go to a place and I can do something and make $20,000 and do maybe two or three events. Like I'm good for that. Like I want to have that recurring program and that recurring money. So I started saying, well, churches don't really do that. They don't have the capacity. Um, Schools at the time, many of my schools were not doing that. Now they are, but I'm like, okay, who's doing that? I'm like, corporate audiences are doing that. Like universities are doing that. Mm -hmm. So how can I position myself there? So I took this message of depression. And I said, okay, if I go to speak to Toyota, they don't care about depression. Toyota doesn't. Toyota cares about bottom line. They care about productivity. They care about these things. So they care about performing at a higher level. I'm like, how do I take this depression? So I literally drew a line. So if you think so, if you can see me now, take a white sheet of paper, draw a horizontal line. And then I put depression kind of right at the top. And I said, what makes people have depression? Like, what's the, like, what's the commonality between people? Like, what's one thing we all have in common? So I just started brainstorming. I said, we all have our thoughts in common. People that have depression, they are in more negative thought land a little bit longer versus people that are in positive thought. So one end of the line, I put negative. The other end of the line, I put positive. And I've always talked about like thinking up and I said, that's it. I help people think up. Whether you have depression or not, we all need to think and elevate our thinking a little bit higher. Mm -hmm. We all need to focus on where we want to go and develop the mental habits to get there. So I took the message of depression and flipped that and made it into a corporate message too. So I created this 80 framework. I call it my 80-20. It's my 80 framework. No matter where I go, I'm going to talk the, print, the same principles. The 20% is what I do if I'm working with a school, if I'm working with students, or if I'm working with educators, or if I'm speaking to corporate executives, I'm going to talk that 20%. Mm-hmm. So for example, if I'm in Toyota and I'm talking about Think Up, I'm talking about productivity. I'm talking about showing up as your best version. I'm talking about doing the mental work before you even step into your office. If I'm on a college campus and I'm talking to resident assistants, I'm talking about the same concept, but I'm just using their language. So that's how I took this this so small churchy message of depression and really flipped it and built out a program. And it took me two years to really kind of what I call stick my landing, to really have something that I felt this is like golden. And I hired a coach. Love it. And someone else, because I could not get myself to that level. I couldn't. So once I figured out, oh, I want to talk. Okay. I talk depression. How do I do this? I hired a coach to help me make it beautiful. Yeah, no, that's amazing. I love that. And I love also that you you reverse engineered it. You realized yeah. you wanted long money. You wanted money that's reoccurring from companies and corporations. And that is, that's just, that's genius, genius. Yeah. And it's important because I tell people you need a signature talk. You need to have a, a program or a platform or something that kind of breaks down your, um, like I do the currency of confidence and we talk about mindset, beliefs, and actions. Like that is the signature yeah. talk. And it's easy to remember like MBA because people think of school, but it's like yeah. a mental MBA. Um, yes. So I think that and it's I really vital. Actually, and I talk about Tahoe, thoughts, actions, habits, outcomes. 
Yep. Something easy to remember. Something easy to remember. You definitely need that. So when you're at these companies and you're getting the long, the longer contracts, are those contracts from just a series of talks or are they also from consulting? Are they also from other things? How did you develop your packages? So there's two. So some are just from talks. So I have one that I'm doing next week. It's a new contract that we started. This is straight, strictly talking. Another one that um, I just wrapped up and I'm about to renew and get another one for a six figure contract, which would be the largest ever. That's going to be more consulting. So the way that I determine my signature packaging, I looked at what's the one thing that I do extremely well. And that's what I'm going to teach other people how to do. Initially, I had a hundred different things on there and People were buying wherever they wanted to buy. And I said, you know what? And this was probably a recent kind of shift, maybe the last 15, 18 months. I said, I'm going to do one thing. And the one thing that I do is that I teach people how to maximize their message. And I'm going to do that. How do I do that? That may be consulting, that may be speaking, but that's what I'm going to do. So it was really just me pulling back and saying, you know what? I'm tired of working in this business. And, and, And just to be honest, I was so burnt out. I was speaking all the time. I was traveling all the time. Uh, When I first started, I had one child. In the midst of where my business kind of really blew up in a positive way, I had two new babies. Mm. And my second daughter was on 60-something flights by the time she was eight months. And then now I have baby number three. So I had two babies in two years. I'm like, you know what? Like, I'm getting burnt out. Like, I love speaking, but 60, 70 talks a year is a lot. Yeah, that's a lot. I got little kids. I'm not going to do this. So I said, you know what? If I'm going to do this, I'm going to do one thing and I'm going to stick my one landing and I'm going to maximize this one space and I'm going to do less and I'm going to make more. So I moved from working 50 hours a week to now I only work 20 hours a week. I work Monday through Thursday, 20 hours a week, and I make 400% more than what I made working all those hours. I love that. And that's that's probably from a lot from implementing those longer term corporate contracts. So those are the contracts that you're saying take from um, from cold call to close four months. Yeah. And if I was starting out, actually, you, you know, you know, because I always think about that, like, yes, I think I had to go through this in order to get to this space. But if I was starting out, what I would tell new speakers is to find one thing and go so hard in that one thing. Like if you want to be a college speaker, kill the college speaker market. Like if you want to do corporate, kill the corporate work, like offer them one solid thing, set your prices reasonable. So like you said at the very beginning where you can do five, you can do 10, you can do 15 where you don't have to do all of this. And that's what I do now. So now I do around 15 events for, um, since 2000 and so 2017, so 17, 18, and 19, I only do around 15 events and I make 400 times more. Mm-hmm. And I went up on my prices and I told myself, nobody's going to pay for this. Girl, you crazy. You don't have enough experience. You're not qualified enough. You're not smart enough. You're not a Lisa Nichols. You're not such and such. Nobody's going to pay you for that. And the minute that I said, just internally, this is going to be my new fee. I'm going to, I don't care who pays it. I don't care if they don't pay it, but this is what I'm going to, somebody immediately out of the blue, that will pay you this. And that's really all you need. And honestly, I think it's more nerve wracking saying your fee for the first time than it is actually <laughs> actually setting the fee. Yeah. And you get more comfortable the more you say it. Um, yeah. So I think that's really, really, really important um, to do that. And then there is something to the fact that corporations have a different price point and budget than companies. So if Blue Cross Blue Shield is calling you to do a keynote, if you're less than, I think one of our um, one of our interviewees said that if you're less than fifteen thousand, they don't take you seriously, anyways. So you have to kind of wow. know what the what people are expecting, what your clients are expecting. That's true because I pitched to a school, so it was a school district. I was really trying to get into. This was in two thousand and fifteen and sixteen, and I asked for thirty five hundred, and they said no. They went with the other company that was eighteen thousand dollars. And I thought I was trying to save them money because I'm like, I understand your school district. You know, you guys have a tight budget. So, you know, I'm going to wave and it's going to be 3500 And they went with somebody $18,000. I said, never again. The next year I had the contract. <laughs> yes, that's amazing. And I was, and I was and so petty getting the contract. <laughs> so you were, you were pitching to a school district to do multiple engagements for their school? No, this was, no, this was just a one training that I was going to do. It was just a one, two hour training. And I 
the 3500 because I thought for this school district because they said they have tight budget constraints and all these things. And I'm like, well, I'll just do 3500 It's only two hours. You know, it's literally five minutes from my house. So it doesn't require anything else. And they went with a company for 18000 I sh- I, I could have slapped myself. Yeah, it's like, it's like perception, perception of value. And a lot of times when schools call and they, they don't have a budget, sometimes I think when I first learned that they can just write a grant for it, I think I was just like, okay, I'm, never, I'm, not, I'm not worrying about my fees anymore. Because I had a school that was just like, oh yeah, we can't afford your rate, but just give me till July, I'll write a grant for it and then we'll be able to pay your full rate. It's no problem. And I was like, so when what? They used to tell you no, Ashley, did you ever kind of internalize it or take it personal or were you just already shifting and moving? No, because I pitch 300 schools a week. So for me, it's like, you know, I'm, and then I, so I have a team member that sends my pitch emails to 300 schools. She books okay. the calls. So all I, the only people I talk to are people who've read the email, they understand what I do, and then we're on a call. And then I handle the calls. So if they are on a call with me, they're interested. It's just a matter of whether or not they can afford it. So for me, it's like, if you take time out of your day to call me who you do not know, you want to hire me. You're just trying to figure out whether you can afford to hire me because you've seen the website, you've seen the press. You're like, "Mm, I don't know if we can afford her. And I think that it's almost better for them to... Because if they don't think they can afford you, but they can buy your books, they can do something else. So no, I don't internalize it. If they can't, you know, if they can't afford it right then and there, then it's... I don't, I don't really, I don't want to say I don't care, but it's like, I can't worry about that. Yeah. Like yeah. Now with the transition of like pitching 50, 60, $70,000 contracts, that's like a whole different um, ball game. And it's based so, it's so much more, it's not so much based on numbers as it is on relationships and yes. the right people to pitch yes. those agreements to. Yes. And like, and you know, and one thing that my coach used to tell me, because I was, so when I was moving up and I was like, well, I'm 3,000. And he's like, why don't you just say 5,000? I'm like, well, 3,000, like three, like 5,000 is a lot. And he was like, number one, don't count nobody else's money. Right. And, <laughs> and he was like, if they have three, they have five. And if they have five, they have 10. And I did not believe it until years later. I'm like, shut the front door. They really have more money. Yeah. So they have three. And the same work that you put into getting a 5,000 contract, 5,000 contract is the same that you're going to put in getting a $10,000 contract. It's the same work. It is like, there's nothing different. My process from getting the $1,000 is the same as what I do to get the 10 and $15,000 now. It's the same process. Yeah. And I mean, and that's the thing too. And then people just take you more seriously, I believe as well. And then you have to do the job of not letting people waste your time. Like for me, that's the issue is like, sometimes, you know, they know that if I'm the, if I'm the consultant, I'll take them to lunch, you know, we'll go somewhere nice, I'll pay for it. And sometimes the people that are going on these lunches, they don't have any power or control, which is why I like the process of having a call. Then you can identify, okay, great, this person has absolutely no power. Awesome, but they may know the person that does. Okay, so what can I get from this? Because I need to be, because we don't have a lot of time, you know? So it's like, you have to be strategic and not be afraid to ask the questions that matter. And if this is a person that you know can't hire you, great, but they've been in the industry, ask them, okay, well, who have you seen the company work with in the past? Who have they, because then you can go look at that person, figure out what their rates are. And I think there's a a website called eSpeaker that um, one of my, one of the people that I listen to a lot said to go look at and look up all the ten, fifteen thousand dollars speakers, figure out who their clients are, pitch those individuals for either um, a product that's ancillary or that's the same. They may be, they may be looking for something different. Um, but the other thing I've done is when there is an engagement for someone who is not, they're not sold on me for whatever reason because there is still this thing of you know, you're a black woman. I've literally had yeah. white male speakers go and and pitch engagements and they get them right away. There's like this automatic trust there that I do not have. Um, But what I do have is I'm a better speaker. Most of the time, I'm just a better speaker. So I will go and do the engagement just for my travel, kill it, get all the reviews on video. I get my own reviews on video, send those to the organizer. And the following year, I'm booked at my full rate. I've had people who've been the keynote for a conference for five years and they called me like, I'm sorry, we we are we should have booked you as a keynote last year. All the attendees were like, "When's that girl coming back?" Like she killed it, and they have switched it up. An old girl who was on the keynote stage is now yeah. doing the breakout. Yeah. Like I will do whatever it takes because I know once I get in the room, I'm excellent. So it's not a problem. Yeah. Like I will never be outspoken in a stage. Like it'll never be a situation where it's like, "Oh, she was good, but everyone else was so much better." Never in my life. Never. That will never Actually, happen. That is the, the best thing. is like I'm on par. The the worst is like she's uh, she's just as good as everyone else. I don't care if it's Tony Robbins. You're not out speaking me. 
Ashley, we just <laughs> talked about that yesterday in my mastermind circle with these with my sisters. We were like, why do we, especially women, especially African American women, why do we have a hard time saying, you know what, I'm great at this. Like I'm excellent. Like we like we kind of want to downplay it, but I'm like, I'm the best at what I do. Yeah. Like we're not gonna out like there's one speaker, she is a Caucasian woman, and she considers herself the Tony Robbins, the female version of Tony Robbins. And she's like, I'm dynamic. I'm the best speaker. And I look at her and I'm like, I mean, you're good, but I'm better. And that's like, exactly how you have to feel, especially in an industry that's based on your performance. I think you can, it's, you can, you can say someone else is good, but you should not feel like you aren't exceptional. And for me, it's like, I know that speaking, I'm, I'm a speaker because if I work at it, if I put my effort into it, speaking is the thing that I could be the best in the world at. And every person who's speaking should feel the same way. That if you put the time in, if you're dedicated, if you do what it takes, you should, the thing that you're called to do, your passion, your purpose, whatever, it's going to be the thing that you could be the best in the world at. Why would God give me this passion so I could be mediocre at it or like make audience say, Meh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what to exactly. take from that. I don't understand. <laughs> exactly. It's like Muhammad Ali. He said when he started fighting, he started telling himself that he's the greatest, that he's the champ. He's the greatest in the world. And he said, when I started telling myself that, then everybody else started calling me that. And I became that. Yeah. And it was like, you know, like, don't like, don't downplay your gift. If God gave you the gift, you know, I said the other day, be cocky with your gift. Yeah. Like if God gave it to you, be cocky with it. And like, put the I, work in. Like, Yes. Actually, we could talk like forever. Like we could do like a part two of this. I know we will. We'll have to do a part two for sure. So tell everyone on Speak Your Way to Cash where they can find you. Yes, guys. You can follow me anywhere on social media by using the hashtag ThinkUp. I'm all over social media, literally at Think Up. You can also go to my website. It's thinkyourwayup.com. You can go there and you'll find where I am, all the things that we're doing, and we can just stay stay connected. I give a lot of free tools, a lot of trainings, a lot of things that just really help you elevate and shift. And of course, there's also some ways if you want it to work with me, you can. Absolutely. And we're going to post a link on um, for her free training on how to get booked and paid to speak so that they can download that so that all of you all in the Speak Your Way to Cash family can have that. As always, be sure to join our Facebook group. Thank you so, so much again for joining us. And we'll definitely have to have you back on the Speak Your Way to Cash podcast. I would love to. Thank you so much, Ashley. Wasn't that interview amazing? I know we went a little long, but all the details that we gave out in this interview are life changing for speakers. So please listen to it all, share, rate this podcast, share it with your friends. And if you're in either Chicago or Atlanta, I hope to see you at the live Speak Your Way to Cash event. And if you can't make those events live, but you want to connect, join the Speak Your Way to Cash Facebook community where we give out free speaking tips every single day during the week. Talk to you guys soon.